What is the liver? The liver is a large organ found to the right of your stomach. The average healthy liver weighs about 1.5 kilograms and is around 15 centimetres thick. The liver has two large sections called the right lobe and the left lobe. The gallbladder sits under the liver along with parts of the pancreas and intestines. The liver and these organs work together to digest, absorb and process food. There are many functions of the liver. One of the liver's main job is to filter the blood coming from the digestive tract before passing it to the rest of the body. The liver also detoxifies chemicals that we ingest through food or drink and metabolises drugs to get rid of them from our bodies. The liver also makes proteins important for blood clotting and many other functions. But why am I telling you about the liver? In this video, I'm going to explain a bit about the research going on in Dr. Zanya Stamataki's lab in the Institute of Immunology and Immunotherapy at the University of Birmingham. Dr. Zanya and her team are focused on researching viral infections and chronic illnesses in the liver. In this video, we're going to talk about one specific area of research that she's carrying out that involves the death of liver cells, the unusual way that these dead cells are sometimes cleared, and the impact of this. So what is cell death? Just like us, each cell in our body goes through a natural life cycle, and at the end of this cycle, everything must die. In cells, there are two types of cell death. The natural death at the end of the cycle is called apoptosis. The other form of cell death, necrosis, occurs at some point during the cell's life due to an unexpected cause. So, what is apoptosis? Apoptosis is sometimes referred to as programmed cell death, in other terms, cell suicide. This doesn't sound like a very good thing, however this is the better way for the cell to die. This is because apoptosis is the natural end to the cell cycle, so the body is prepared for it. Although cells dying might sound bad, if cells don't die it can lead to a tumour forming, which our bodies are trying to avoid. In order to visualise this process, I want you to imagine the cell as a car. One day, you're driving down the road and you notice something wrong with the car. You can hear a strange noise and a warning light flashing. This makes you pull over and call a tow truck. Unfortunately, your car has come to the end of its life. It has left no mess or caused no damage to any other cars on the road because you were able to pull over and let the car be moved safely. The car is taken to a scrapyard where important parts can be recycled and the rest of the car can be disposed of. And this is exactly what happens in your body. When the cell is triggered to die, important proteins called caspases will begin to break down important cellular components, just like the workers at the scrapyard. Enzymes called DNases will also come and help break down the DNA which is found in the nucleus. As the cell starts to shrink because of these enzymes, the cell sends out distress signals. A special cell known as a macrophage hears these signals and will come and clear away the dying cell. It does this by engulfing it and leaving nothing behind. Imagine the macrophage acting like a Pac-Man. The process of the dead cell being engulfed by the macrophage is called phagocytosis. Now, let's talk about the other type of cell death, necrosis. Necrosis is not programmed and can be a bit messy. Necrosis of cells is caused by outside factors. This could be a toxic substance, such as a drug or alcohol, an injury, or if the cell has been cut off from the blood supply, amongst other factors, such as infection. Let's imagine the cell as a car again. This time, the car is hit by something, such as a lorry. The car explodes, throwing debris everywhere. Not only has the car had a premature death, but it's also damaged many cars around it. The traffic will be disrupted and there may even be a permanent mark left on the road. There will be a large response from different types of emergency services, such as firemen, police and ambulances. Now let's think about this in our own bodies. Some form of damage will occur to the cell. This could be any of the factors mentioned before, including drugs, alcohol or injury. This triggers the cell to swell. The organelles also swell and the contents of the nucleus starts to change shape. Eventually, the cell membrane bursts and the contents spills out. Special detection cells in the body see this and cause an inflammatory response. This means the area will become swollen, red, inflamed and painful. This inflammation alerts your body's immune system to the damage and debris released by the cell. The immune system has the right cells and equipment to then come and clear away the mess. Small amounts of necrosis are fairly normal. However, when there is an increase of any of the factors mentioned, drugs, alcohol, infection and lack of blood, then the level of necrosis increases dramatically. This therefore increases the level of inflammation. 
This can cause scarring in tissue and causes the tissue to not work properly. And this is not what we want in our bodies. So to summarise the differences between apoptosis and necrosis. Firstly, apoptosis is characterised by cellular shrinkage, whereas necrosis is characterised by cellular swellage. In apoptosis, only one cell is affected, whereas in necrosis, many cells surrounding the dying cell are affected. Apoptosis results in no inflammatory response, however necrosis causes a significant inflammatory response. In apoptosis, the membrane will bleb but remains intact, whereas in necrosis, the membrane breaks apart, releasing the cell's content. The cause is also different in both apoptosis and necrosis. In apoptosis, the cause is programmed cell death, however necrosis is caused by external factors that we've discussed beforehand. So, back to Dr Zanya's research. What is her team actually investigating? Well, in Zanya's lab, they are looking into numerous things, but one thing in specific is to look into a very unusual way in which cells are sometimes cleared in the liver after they have died. Here you can see the cellular architecture of the liver. When we talk about liver cells, we usually mean hepatocytes. Hepatocytes are the most common type of liver cell, making up around 80% of all cells in the liver. It is known that these hepatocytes also possess the ability to engulf dying cells, just like the macrophage we saw earlier. This process is known as hepatocyte efferocytosis. It is thought that they play an important role in clearing dead cells in both healthy liver and inflamed liver. But how do they do this? Well, the answer is that no one really knows yet for sure. And this is what Zanya's team are researching. What is actually known about hepatocyte efferocytosis at the moment? Because the liver has such an important role in removing toxic substances from the blood, its cells have a high exposure to these substances, which we now know will cause cell death via necrosis. The liver has learned how to deal with cell death in an unusual way that allows it to avoid an inflammatory response. As you know, when a hepatocyte goes through necrosis, it spills out its content. In the process of hepatocyte efferocytosis, the neighbouring cell quickly engulfs the dying cell and all of its content before it's detected by anything in the body. This means the immune system doesn't notice that the cell has died and no inflammation will occur. What happens if efferocytosis doesn't happen? Firstly, there will be an increase in liver disease risk. Usually, clearing of dying cells reduces the risk of specific types of liver diseases, as well as promoting the reversal of liver scarring that is caused by inflammation. So without efferocytosis, scarring will worsen and your chance of liver disease will increase. But what do we still not know? Some of the current questions being researched at the moment include How exactly do the hepatocytes recognise the dying cells? How is efferocytosis controlled in a healthy liver compared to in a diseased or cancerous liver? Is efferocytosis controlled in the same way all over the liver? And can efferocytosis be used as a form of medical treatment for liver diseases or even cancer? These are all questions that hopefully will be answered at some point in the near future.